Trinidad and Tobago possesses a unique and diverse culture driven by African and Indian traditions involving rhythm. These rhythmic traditions have laid the foundation for unity in an ethnically plural society and have also become a major part of the cultural identity of the nation and its people. Trinidadians, as I say, are party people. We love the party, we love the fete, we like anything to do with party. The rhythm touches you in a way that you have no melody, you have no song to follow. But there's the beat of that drum and the instruments that come in to make that rhythm, that section of rhythm that you're going with is what moves people, is what is free them up, is what is take away the stress, is what is take away all the troubles. You could follow, follow with your wife, whoever else, when you hear that rhythm, you're bound to dance, you're bound to smile, you're bound to enjoy. I think that here, there's definitely a little bit more mixing of rhythms. Um, I, I don't know if, if people of Trinidad really know this or not, but but I really hear a, like a melting pot of rhythms in, in the music. There's a kind of inevitable ultimate balance to the way that the rhythm is. It's because of the interweaving and exclamation points along the groove in Trini rhythm patterns. There are a few, few standardized ones, I think. Like in Calypso, or if, um, in Trini Orisha drumming, or in um, like Tassa, that there is a, 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 a constant beat on the 16. You know, I mean, it's on the um, the way that we express those things when you put them together or on their own with accompaniments just make you want to dance like that's what the rhythm does if rhythm does stuff to you on a cellular level on a physical level a spinal level an energetic level then when i represent the rhythm section and play our rhythm patterns or if it's in the music that that plays when we're on stage people just go crazy and lose their mind and dance you know it's a free up kind of thing from the 16th to 19th century africans would be brought to trinidad and tobago via the transatlantic slave trade bringing with them a diverse and complex rhythmic and artistic culture. When they came here, they were adults. Didn't bring children. So they came with what they know as young people growing up in the environment. And who's the people who came to Trinidad? They came mainly from West Africa. What is their history in relation to percussion and music making and singing and chanting and, you know, dancing? You know, what's their tradition? Drums were not brought here. Um, we were not, Africans were not allowed to bring drums. What, what happened as, as the slave masters would not have known who among the Africans being, who were enslaved and brought here, who were drummers or who were priests or priestesses or whatever. The drum tradition came in, in the, within the hearts of those who built and played drums. And secretly, you know, against what took place on the plantation, African people continued to, you know, in, in underground ways, most times, preserve the drum and the drum tradition. To some people out there, the drum would have been a distressing thing to even hear, and to others it would be something that they would lean on for their spirituality. You know, and it, it, the drum, traditionally, for those of us who appreciate our African heritage, is, is central to our communication with, with, with God, appreciation of music or understanding of the, the cosmos and the fact that the universe is, is built on rhythm, you know, the seasons, the, the growing of the trees, everything, you know. There was this one understanding of the connection between rhythm, the beat of the heart, the movements of the seasons and all things that happen on the planet, you know. So there was this connection that Africans made with the drum in relation to all these things. All we had was the drum and the voice and we body to dance. So that's all we had and we use it. We have a whole repertoire in choreography related to that whole experience, you know what I mean? That's, you know, that's the, how the body does move and, you know, when you see that, you know what it represents in a kind of a way, like a language then. The African people, just had to have that rhythm to console them, to give them that courage that all is not lost and you know, even though they're not in the motherland, we still 
you know, holding on to something that we have and we could create rhythm out of this. All the resources that we have, we could still use it and create rhythm and make ourselves happy even though we really aren't, but we still make and do with what we have. African life relied heavily on the drum as it was directly connected to recreation, communication, and most importantly, spirituality. It is said that spirits, the drum summons spirits. You know, because the drum, it, when it vibrates, it, it communicates in the unseen, the seen and unseen realm. So we find that uh, there will be situations in which drummers would play and you might find somebody in that gathering might start a dance on control of you and stuff and it, then it would be a sign that in some cases an orisha or any sort of entity or other entity or divinity would have come into that space. Drum is the call. You sing the song for the spirit, that song to call the spirit. And when you're singing that the drum play, the drummer himself especially, the lead drummer playing the steps of the spirit. So the spirit from whatever realm is coming from here in that steps and coming dancing with a force. Africans understood that drumming, drumming sent a message out to the cosmos. You know, um, you would, drummers, over the years of studying drumming, you would hear of rhythms for, for, for rain and rhythms for various things, for planting and all that. You know, the drum played this role in sending that signal out to the cosmos. And that's where the spirits dwell, so, you know. We had discovered ways of, of coding information, um, passing on stuff, um, and, and doing all kinds of things, and communicating with parts of the human anatomy that you can't access normally, communicating with deity, uh, communicating with ancestors, going back into his cellular memory, um, through sound through certain codes and certain things, like that particular beat played that way with this song will always produce this trance which will make X happen. After the abolition of slavery in 1838, the need for cheap labor would bring indentured Indian workers to the shores of Trinidad and Tobago. They brought with them a variety of percussive instruments, but one drum and drumming style in particular would become more prominent and prevalent than the others. Average Trinidad then appreciating East Indian drumming. Tassa is the drum, is the signature drum there, more than the tabla and the dolok. Tassa drum came from India with the indentured laborers. When they came here, they bring along all the instruments, what they could have bring, or they look for raw materials to make the instruments. The differences between the Indian Tasha and Trinidadian Tassa is that the Tassa cutter drums and the bass in um, the Indian tradition is a lot shallower and the drums are more high pitched, tuned tighter. They're steel, I believe. I believe some of them are actually made of steel. Shallower, more high pitched than they cut the drums. Similar style of playing though, with that, um, the bamboo, flexible bamboo sticks. Rolling, lots more rolling though and really strange, intricate patterns. I didn't realize what kind of um, finesse went into playing the drums. Um, and they, they play them, you know, they don't play them like we play sticks here. Um, they play them kind of here, which I have, I need to learn. I think it's really neat. Um, and so they're able to get a lot of finesse from that, but they're really long sticks. So it's kind of amazing for me to see how they're able to get all those notes and get them, so they're so clean. Um, but out of using a technique that's completely different than anything else I've seen. Some Hindu people will use it for like a festival, um, Ganesh Jag. They, 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 um, they use it, they play the drums and like when they even carry a murti, you know? So these kind of things, the religious aspect for it, it's still there because in now present, people still use Tassa for that. And we use it for um, the weddings. And then the Muslim people use it for Husi. I went to Hosei in St. James and um, and the you know the, the structure of the rhythm seems to be quite um, quite strict uh, in terms of the the tassa drumming I heard there. There was lots of, um, of sort of set pieces, if you like. Whereas in, in other places where I've heard tassa drumming, it seems to be more improvised. So it seems to be different schools of thought there. That festival would have almost single-handedly popularised tassa drumming nationally because. St. James being a multi-ethnic community, you would have people of 
various ethnicities, and then you have Muslims who would be both African and East Indian. So a natural mix took place there in terms of people tuning into Tassa Drum. We said that the Indian Ted laborers bring the Tassa Drum to, to Trinidad, but the Tassa Drums were not invented in India. It was invented in Persia with the, um, the, the Muslim. The, the Mughals are people um, that overthrew India and when they overthrew India, they, 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 um, the Persians took over and they bring, bring across their instrument. Because of the fact that the East Indian community has maintained, has been able to maintain a lot of its traditions due to what happened with Indian as as compared to, let's say, shutters, as compared to shutter and slavery, uh, the East Indian percussion in the East Indian community was always predominant. I mean, some of the earliest drums I heard outside of the, when I was small here in Kalinda drums playing the junction in New Grant by my grandmother. It was Tassa, I heard Tassa. I stay home and heard Tassa play. And it was something we grew up understanding that the East Indian community played drums. And then later on you got to realize that there's Tassa, there's Dulok, there's Tabla, there's Daf, and various drums. So um, clearly, any East Indian music, whether it could be traditional East Indian music from India or East Indian music created in Trinidad, would have a strong percussive effect, expressing the, the East Indian percussion. Well, I have a theory that Tassa in Trinidad and Tobago has become a lot more Africanized than a lot of people would think, because if you go and you talk to a Tassa group, you know, whether it's in, uh, you know, like St. John's or Carib Tassa group or whatever, they have different names for each of the hands. It's a different hand. Just like, like if you talk to, uh, to Lavender Rhythm Section, there's different names for hands. Or Risha drummers have different names for hands. Um, and one of the hands is a Calypso hand. One of them is a kind of Kalinda hand. Um, Calypso and Kalinda, both very African in root, predominantly. Um, and I think just by you know, the propensity to add a bit more bass into it and the way that the bass is actually played more like a junjun or a dun dun bass, um, maybe it's something that was a result of a cross pollination or just by proximity sick. But I, I, yeah, definitely, because I play African drums and I play tassa and I could feel that there's quite a similarity in it. The rhythms, uh, I think, very much have a, a very similar um, idea in the, in the, the the bass, the bass is the, the dual drums. Um, they have some of the same kind of rhythms that you would see in other drumming, um, but the, the tassa drumming the drums themselves are, are um, kind of unique because of the way they play them and this, it's a very cutting sound, you know, and very fast, <laughs> virtuosic. Because of the fact that it's a loud, a drum that could be heard, you know, and it has a presence because of its volume, it, it became popular at various events, parties, etc. And over time, it became, you know, a drum that you would hear and identify with. There's a timestamp for, I guess, the, um, the cultural memory that we have in Trinidad, uh, from whichever background we've come. And I think when the Indian people came across from India at the time they did, that is the culture that remained in Trinidad. It would not be long after Indian arrival in 1845 that the drum traditions of both the African and Indian communities would begin to draw negative attention from the colonial powers. 1858, in 1869, in 1871, 1872, 1880, the police stopped the carnival. In some cases, they used the Marines to, 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 to stop the Kambule version of carnival, then, to suppress it. That is what it was, to suppress it. And in 1881, there was a response to that, where the police were defeated, and the governor had to go and negotiate with the people in the, in the market in Port of Spain. That's the Cambule riots. The Commission of Inquiry, led by Magistrate Hamilton from England, recommended a number of things. One of these things was that the African drum should be banned. The first time people saying that we are Trinidadian, the multi-ethnic kind of mix, saying that they're Trinidadian. Um, so you have on one hand the colonial state saying that you can't practice carnival and especially the drums, the stick fighting, all those kind of rituals attached to it and that kind of stuff. That's the thing that frightened them, the military kind of militant aspect of it and that kind of thing. And East Indians that you can't practice horsey. 
1884, the Hussein riots, the drum was at the center and drum players was at the center of that thing in, when the police slaughtered so many people who, you know, especially East Indian people who were celebrating Hussein in 1884 in San Fernando. Those 1881 riots and the 1884 massacre in South is a good place to see where both African and Indian traditions kind of cemented, kind of united. We didn't have to wait until 1970 with the, with the Black War riots to see them Indians and Africans join together. They joined together as early as 1884. Both traditions, and both traditions survived. So when that stifle, people are bursting with creativity. They just want to knock something. So sup oppression and suppression give birth to a new, vibrant children to be moved. The riots of the 1880s would lead to the banning of the drum, particularly the animal skin drums. This would force the people to seek other ways of creating rhythm. Enter the Tambu Bamboo. Drum was banned and the practice of calendar was banned in the city, kind of thing. And um, so the drum was banned with it and the Tambu Bamboo came out as the next form of expressing the same rhythms but on bamboo. The French for drum is tambour, T-A-M-B-O-U-R. But you know the Trinidad version became tambu to rhyme nice with bamboo. It is in fact a, a range of instruments. There was the bass, boom they call it. Then there was the, the fule, which is like the middle range, a smaller bamboo. And then there was the cutter, which was the bamboo carrying the, like the treble line there. That came about after a couple of years of searches going on, search. When in 1884, the, the African drum was officially banned and removed from the carnival celebrations. So the people who had that, who used the drum, of course, is the people of African descent. The bamboo was the thing that was most readily here, available here. If you had to get wood, you had to buy it. You could go in the hill and pick your bamboo. And we formulate that bamboo, we keep the tambu bamboo, we came the instrument of the day. So there is no per se tambu bamboo music and tambu bamboo song because tambu bamboo was used for everything. Stick fight, bongo, um, the, the tambu bamboo setting any rhythm. If you listen to some of the old time calypso, you hear the song of the tambu bamboo in it as well too. So the bamboo took the place of skin drums, animal skin drums. Only for a while, only for a short while, because what has happened is that while they, don't, they didn't like the song of the African skin drum, they felt that the bamboo didn't resonate as much so as to cause the spirits to come. Bamboo being what it is, could not, the average bamboo instrument couldn't last in terms of the, the pressure knocking against the road like that because you had the base bamboos that would be hitting the ground, you know? So, bamboos would actually mash up. And as a result of that, the idea came that, hey, you know, a man would knock over a dustbin and realize he's getting a song from it. And after a while, dustbins started to go missing because in those days it was metal dustbins and not plastic. So that was the early entry of the dustbin as a rhythmic instrument on the road for carnival. Necessity proved to be the mother of invention as new infrastructural developments threatened the expression of rhythm on the road. The ingenuity of the people would again be put to the test. By that time too, the road started to get paved and all that kind of thing. So this, that boom, that's the one that we ought to go for, said the, the one that near the heart be there. So when that happened, when them drum, when this bamboo split and the boat and thing, it was almost a reflex action to look for something else to beat. Because remember, the principle there is percussion, is rhythm, right? That is what they had. Right? Rhythm. When you're looking for something and you're coming down a road in a community, what would be at the side of the road? The people, dustbins, metal container. So if it had stuff in it, boom, they empty that. And it's down the road you're going. Beating up the dustbin is part, again, is part of a, the tradition being of Africans finding something to beat. One does not know the exact date, what exact time, but one knows that Africans found anything to beat. The bamboo thing was the tradition, so dustbin was an evolving kind of thing, then it was now coming in onto the scene. And Prince Batson was explaining that the older fellas, the bamboo men then, 
find them fellas with the dustbin, the younger fellas then, that they find it has been noisy and they're making too much noise, they go from here with that. <laughs> so it's a dog. So you understand, it was a process there of one replacing the other. It didn't happen this kind of well. well. They discovered dustbin and metal containers, and next kind of well, it had no bamboo band. It wasn't like that. It was a phase kind of process. How did we look at that dustbin? and convert it into an orchestra that just doesn't but that's what we did i mean um so the thing is is, is that um we figure out a way for the drum to survive because that's the way that the drum works that means uh the forerunners of the steel band um in the sense that it doesn't start and stop but it's just continuing to find it just finding finding anything not just to make noise, but to keep up the drums since the skin drums were bad. Alexander Ragtime Band is another example of that. They had the same problem on the road. Bamboo mat break up. What do you do? You, you take metal containers and them is, I think it's one of the first bands to come out with complete metal containers thing. Without bamboo, you know? Them was like setting the trend that was to, to follow. You know? Then a good thing, in a sense, the war came, the, the anti-fascist war, World War II. Two, the band carnival for five years. So, in a sense, men had time to experiment. Hit metal all day, song would change. Ideas would come about putting notes. That is the next phase, where the discovering now Melody. I find it always kind of weird that we upset the evolution of drum to tambo bang to pan. But if you put those three things next to one another, it's not like a, you know, it's like, it's not like a, well, of course. <laughs> As the steel pan began to evolve as a vehicle for expression and national identity, the rhythmic engine driving this musical phenomena would begin to take on a life of its own. Rhythm section to me is that, is, people would say is a, is a high, is a high, because it's, it's, it's that overjoyous feeling, you can't describe it, it's just, you just want to express yourself. The rhythm section is the heart and soul, I think, of Trinidadian drumming culture. It's pretty intense. There's nobody just playing on a drum, just kind of, you know, none of that. They would not, that wouldn't fly, you know, they're, they're in it. They just put everything they can into when they play. You know, stylistically bring something together in a very organized way, but still sounds like the freedom of Trinidadian drumming. Um, a lot of people would call it a bastardization. I've seen purists refer to the style that we drum on congas as a bastardization. Um, simply because we don't use similar hand patterns as a conguero would in, in Cuba or something like that. But uh, rather we play with two mallets and pitum pum pitum pitum pum pitum um, hard as we can because that's how it has to sound in the middle of the drum. So the rhythm section actually emerge as the engine to get people through the streets on the Mother Festival. So something has to be special about that rhythm. Because that rhythm, is, that rhythm is supposed to keep propelling you joyfully through the streets for, I can't remember, it was multiple days before. So it wasn't just two days, for like a week. You're not supposed to feel that you lap in a city, you know, for a week in a constant mood of joy. That's a serious thing. That is why they have 300 Trinidad style carnivals all over the world and one Brazilian carnival. Trinidad and Tobago's carnival is a cultural experience like no other. For two days, the capital city of Port of Spain transforms into one large festival ground, awash with vivid colors and euphoric sounds. Though this annual ritual is full of rhythmic musical variety, it is Calypso, the music of Panorama and Soca that have come to define the sound of Trini Carnival. The, the drum tradition of beaten drums was always in the Calypso. 
But one cannot say it was a Jews and a special year. It was obviously that Africans bought it here and Africans used it drunk throughout. So the Calypso is only a continuation of music using the drums. Now, you have the Calypsonians over the years who put that Orisha feel and singing about the Orisha. And a lot of people feel it started with Ella and Ella and a couple of people before. This, this, this started way back in the 30s with the Roaring Lions, Calypsonians, why must he even call the name? This started with them singing Calypsos about their experience and bringing the songs of the Orisha Palais into the thing. As African consciousness developed in the 70s, there were Calypsonians who would sing direct themes on Africa. Right? Bali sang Shaka Shaka, there were many others. And drums were used. And then as time went on, you find drums in the Calypso tent. You'd find artists who would be of the Orisha persuasion, who were Calypso artists, bringing drums on stage and you know, actually having drumming as part of the recording and performance of the work. You have artists like Andre Tanka, Clive Zander, who would aim into a new wave of, of music that would involve the traditional rhythms, the fusion of the traditional rhythms with contemporary style. The calypso rhythm, like I was saying uh, before, I've heard it in lots of different contexts, and it's, it's by far and away the, the most prevalent rhythm in the, in the Baptist churches, for example. So it's not, it's not just used for entertainment. Like I was saying before, it's used for something much more uh, profound than that. And uh, so for me, that Calypso beat it seems to really speak of something quintessentially Trinidadian. Panorama is basically just this gathering of people. <laughs> just if, if you were to take the, the aspect of competition away from it. A gathering of people just playing for pure excitement and pure, pure hype. That's what kind of what I get from it as a listener. Um, it's just this really condensed, exciting, <laughs> you know, um, driving thing that's it's really kind of short. Each in individual piece is really short, and people just put everything they have into this short thing, and then it's done. It was rhythmically incredibly complex and syncopated, and um, I was really quite astonished by the the ease with which most people in the band, apart from me, <laughs> managed to pick up these, these rhythms which were very, very intricate and precise. I, I was really confused at first because it, when we were practicing the uh, panorama stuff, I was not sure why I wasn't able to get it, but everybody else seemed to go with it, you know, and it would be different. You know, these things that you would think at first would be the same, da get that, da get that, it would, but it would be that guy, get that guy, get that guy, you know? <laughs> but I couldn't figure out when it was supposed to be what. Um, but everybody else it was no problem. And I was like, why, why is this? If you've been in a band for 20 odd years, you're going to be accustomed to the sort of musical gestures, the rhythmic gestures that, that, um, that come across time and time again in a panorama arrangement. Um, but it must be more than that because there was a couple of girls in the section, one was 16 and one was 14 who were fantastic at, at grasping this, this stuff very immediately, and they hadn't been in the band for 20 years. They, they were newcomers. Um, so it must also be something to do with, um, well, incredible musical ability, first of all, as a, on a personal level, but also the, you know, the, the cultural um, music that you're listening to, you know, the music in Soca, Calypso, there must be something in that and, and the steel band band tradition that, that, that people absorb because that's where you, you grow up. So I'm sure that there's an internalization of musical gestures that really helps. Playing Steel Pan in All Stars was um, one of the highlights of my like, career musically to date at all. Um, and uh, it, was, it was an amazing experience both musically and sort of socially and culturally, everything about it was quite mind-blowing. I can't explain it. I played for really large venues before. Football stadiums in the States, huge thousands of people, televised events. And um, the, the level of excitement and level of hype that is in Panorama is way higher. Even if it's fewer people right there in the stands, the level of hype is over the top. Um, so. It's one of those things that you really truly can't explain until you actually get in the middle of it and you're like, you know, all these people screaming and you're, <laughs> you're going to play this actually relatively short piece 
and you're just gonna, you know, you go for it, and you just put everything you have into it, and then it's done in like eight minutes. <laughs> and you get done, and you just kind of want to do more, but it, your part is over, so. Soca music really expresses, you know, my father's story. He grew up in Lingua Princeton, and he grew up in a, in a mixed society. You know, all his friends growing up was East Indians and was East Indian and African community. And they were well, kids, they grew up with the freedom. So he grew up here and he's going across by his neighbor and, you know, eating their food, their culture, playing the drums, listening to them, playing dantal, the, um, the tabla, the dulak, and, you know, understanding the whole experience and having that as something that was a part of his life. If you look at tabla um, and even dolak in the Indian tradition, the way that, that those drums were first used were through religious songs. Um, they call them chautals or bhajans. And uh, in turn, that became chutney music and that sort of thing. You know, it made an evolution from being something that was not secular into being something that's secular. It is a drum tradition that pulls some of the Indians into the carnival. The rhythms. The Eastern and the African rhythms merged together in a unique form is what actually created Soka. And that is the vision of Soka to bridge the gap, you know, and try and bring that unity and for us to see ourselves as Trinidadians and know that we are one with one voice. You know, we come from far different shores, but we tell one story now because our Rhythms are combined and our stories are combined. As it did in the past, rhythm would continue to be the predominant musical gel of Trinidadian society and the cornerstone of racial harmony. Rhythm is, is a, a universal thing that, that all people respond to and I think here in, in Trinidad you've got um, such rhythmically driven musical styles, you know, the East Indian and the, and the Afro-Trinidadian, there's very, there's uh, there's a commonality really of response to rhythm. Now, you have the drummers coming together from Indian and African to merge with rhythms and to make it one. You unite together, you, you share together, which means you, you have to be thinking alike at that particular time. So I see it as um, love and unity within the, the aspect of um, music. Trinidadians have this rhythm, that, this, this thing that's in them and that kind of thing that, that is there. It might have different shades for different peoples and that kind of stuff, so it's Indian version might be a little different than that. But it's that rhythm at its so at its center and its core and it's a thing that kind of harmonizes us, makes us us and those kind of things and it has a in other, other countries. And I think that certainly in, in Trinidad, which is a, is a multicultural society par excellence, you know, it's, it's a the going right back to the national anthem, you know, let every creed and race find an equal place. It's this whole idea of, uh, of of equality and unity, and I think the rhythm really does sort of speak to that. It's, it's something that does um, sort of cut across all divisions, um, in the same way that you know a pan yard, you have all the different uh, sort of divides crossed over: gender, you know, ethnicity, age, um, class. All these things are broken down, and in the same sort of sense, rhythm it does unify people as well. Our contemporary music of the day, whether it was calypso, kaiso, rapso, soca now, um, is inevitably a, a bringing together of all of our drum traditions. Whether it is stuff that comes from our African roots, our Indian roots, our Hispanic roots, um, our Chinese roots, our Middle Eastern roots, I think definitely the, the drum culture is definitely the most binding thing in the, in the, in the music. Yeah? The tassa drumming and the, the steel band pan yards, these are ways of bringing together the community um, in a unique way to get people to work together. Um, and historically, we can look at that. We know that it, it, it got people off the street, you know, and kept people out of trouble um, and worked as a, a, a kind of a, a outreach to the youth, um, which is, I think, a big reason why the rest of the world looks so closely at Trinidad and these pan yards and, and also the, the tassa drumming as well um, in the way it brings together the community because that's what we're missing in the world is this bringing together and that's what we can do through music and the way that Trinidad has done that 
as, as a learning experience to the rest of the world. something that we do. It is us. Rhythm really seems to drive something very significant to people, you know, in a profound way. It's not just an entertainment thing, it's more meaningful than that. I don't think that there is a forum as yet, and we're still fighting to make that forum, for people to hear this stuff, which I personally think that uh, will shock the world the way that we drum. This is a drum nation. The, the, the national instrument is a drum. It's a barrel that notes on it, you know, it's a drum. So we, we can't escape it, it's a, a natural part of everything we do. And I think that the fact that you get rhythm in so many different walks of life, whether that be entertainment, you know, celebration of carnival, whether it be um, a, a Norisha feast or, a, you know, a morning service for a Baptist church or a Tassa band in a wedding, the rhythm sort of is like the heartbeat of, of what goes on in Trinidad. Do so copy people think, do even go too far in copying it and adding it to we own. Get our root. And you again, if you listen to these LM musicians of the day, you will get ideas, you will get a feel, you will get a heartbeat, which is what carries us. The heartbeat of Trini, the heartbeat of tradition, the heartbeat of the people.